Well, Shalom, my name is Todd Bennett, and this is the weekly recording of the Shema Israel newsletter titled Water in the Wilderness. Well, this was originally published as a newsletter on day 26 of month 1 on the Creator's calendar, also known as April 6th, 2024, on the Roman calendar. Uh, it was also day 11 in the counting of the Omer that leads us to Shavuot, on the 50th day. The command to count the Omer is often lost in Jewish tradition uh, known as Lag Ba Omer. Uh, Christians certainly don't follow the command and most people who are uh, aware of it don't really know what to do. It ends up being uh, treated as a ritual without much depth or meaning. I've seen people have pegboards and they move the peg you know along the way through the process, but they, they really uh, lose uh, any idea that there's a rich um, meaning here. It, it seems mysterious, I think, to most people, and they just, uh, they give up. Well, it's actually a very significant time for those who consider themselves to be the bride of Messiah. Remember one of the final teachings of Yeshua involving ten virgins found in Matthew 25? They all went out to meet the bridegroom, but only five of them were wise and made it to the wedding. Uh, the other five were considered foolish because they were not prepared for the journey. Well, the Omer count spans the period when Yisrael was on their journey out of Egypt to their arrival at the mountain of Elohim. Uh, they were a bride on their way to a wedding. So all those who want to make it to the future marriage supper of the Lamb should be paying close attention especially during this uh, specific time of year. Well, I hope that you all had a wonderful Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, this past week when we remembered the day Israel actually exited from Egypt through the parted waters of the Red Sea. <clears throat> that occurred on the, the final day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, that event was not only a great miracle, but it also had incredible future prophetic significance. And here's what we read uh, in the scriptures. When it came to pass, then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that Elohim did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for Elohim said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So, Elohim led the people around by uh, way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, Elohim will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So they took their journey from Sukkot and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness, and Yahuwah went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Uh, that they turn and camp at Pihaheroth uh, between Mig Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon. Uh, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say uh, of the children of Israel, they were bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahuwah, and they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and Pharaoh, uh, the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with the captains over every one of them. And Yahuwah hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the side of the sea of Pihaharoth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, 
the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to Yahuwah. Then they said to Moshe, Because there are no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the et salvation of Yahuwah, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, whom you see today, you shall see again no more. Yahuwah will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your et rod and stretch out your et hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahuwah when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the messenger of Elohim, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his et hand over the sea, and Yahuwah caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry ground, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on a dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that Yahuwah looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled Et, the army of the Egyptians. And he took off Et, their chariot wheels, so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for Yahuwah fights for them against the Egyptians. Then Yahuwah said to Moshe, Stretch out your Et hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So Yahuwah overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So Yahuwah saved Et Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which Yahuwah had done in Egypt. So the people feared Yahuwah and believed Yahuwah and his servant Moshe. Well, this text is filled with so much information that you could write an entire book dissecting uh, the passage. If you look closely, you'll see that I have included some of the Aleph Tahs, the Ets. Whenever I said Et, uh, there was an Aleph Ta in text, but they don't translate into the English text. Well, this event was an example of the salvation, which is Yahshua, or Yasha, of, Hebrew, of Yahuwah. These Israelites could truly say, that they were saved after passing through the waters. And imagine that. They weren't even Christians. Well, we can see that they were saved by the et salvation of Yahuwah. And we know that the name of, of uh, Yeshua the Messiah means Yahuwah saves. Yeshua has been involved in the salvation of the people of Yahweh throughout time. And that has never changed. And we see him throughout the text as the et, the Isle of Tom. The only thing that has changed is the understanding of who his people are. And this is something that needs to be understood. The people who were saved from Pharaoh were the ones who followed Moshe, the prophet, and, and the messenger of Yahuwah. 
they were not a bunch of people who called themselves Jewish and rejected the et salvation of Yahuwah. They were also not a bunch of people who refused to follow the commandments of Yahuwah. Those who were saved trusted in the blood of the Lamb at Pesach and followed the commandments of Yahuwah spoken through Moshe. They kept silent and let Yahuwah save them by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Yes, they complained, but they ended up uh, seeing <laughs> the, the power of Yahuwah. Well, I recommend we all remember that if we want to participate in the future exodus that we that he's planned for those in covenant with him. The problem is that the religions of man have confused people into thinking that the Jews are his people who have already been returned to the land and the Christians are his people who will be raptured into the heavens. No one seems interested in going into the wilderness, but that is where Yahuwah will be meeting with his people that are truly saved by him. We read in Ezekiel 20, 33 through 36. As I live, says Adonai Yahuwah, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. And there I will plead my case with you face to face. Just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will plead my case with you, says Adonai Yahuwah. Well, the event described in the text of Exodus occurred on day 21 of month 1 on the Creator's calendar, which was April 21st. 1437 BCE and the Roman calendar that had not yet been invented, although we can still track that back in time uh, using the, uh, the calendar calculations. And I encourage you to go to uh, TorahCalendar.com so you can actually see how this all works. Well, in the year of the Exodus from Egypt, the Israelites passed through the waters on the first day of the week, which was a Sunday. It was symbolic of a birthing as Israel passed through the waters from the womb of Egypt. Well, interestingly, the children of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, who were elevated to the first and second born of Israel, were both born from an Egyptian womb. Their mother was Egyptian. And you can see their elevation ceremony in Genesis 48, which is often overlooked by people, particularly Christians, who simply don't understand uh, the flow of the covenant. Well, did you notice in the text of Exodus the emphasis on Joseph as well? Amazingly, the bones of their father Joseph also passed through the waters uh, with the Israelites. And none of this is coincidence. It's all meant to point us to a salvation event in the future involving the deliverance of Joseph from the nations. And this all has deep prophetic significance as we consider the notion of being born again from a Hebrew perspective. The concept of uh, being born again uh, did not originate with Christianity. Uh, being born again was not a new concept for Israelites because they understood the significance of passing through the waters. Uh, remember that Abram passed through the waters when he left Babylon on his journey to the land. He crossed the Euphrates first, and then he crossed the, uh, the Jordan. <clears throat> so there were essentially two immersion events in his journey. Likewise, Israel crossed the Red Sea, and they later crossed the Jordan as well. So we see these two immersion or baptism events, and, and the pattern is clear. According to traditional uh, Israelite thought during the time of Yeshua, if you were not born into the covenant on the eighth day, you needed to be born again by joining into the covenant. But even that understanding fell short. Simply being born into the covenant and circumcised on the eighth day was not enough. And of course, we've been discussing this for years <laughs> as we talk about the, the, Israeli, uh, the Israel dilemma and this whole concept of it's not just uh, down to a DNA uh, test, but it's, it, it gets into the heart, the circumcision of the heart. Well, 
that was the essence of the conversation that Yeshua had with Nicodemus that was recorded in John 3. Remember how Yeshua scolded Nicodemus by stating, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Well, Israel, Israel was literally saved when they were birthed on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Their, their first full day of freedom outside of Egypt was day 22 of month 1. It was the eighth day of their journey of deliverance following the first high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it was day 7 in the Omer count. Therefore, it was the first week in the count that leads to the Feast of Weeks. Shavuot. And again, I'm saying this uh, verbally, but you can actually see it if you go to the year 1437 BCE on Torah calendar. You can actually look at the, the month and the days that uh, they journeyed out of Egypt. And it helps you if you see it. You can visualize it there. So their first full day of freedom is focused on 7 and 8. And that is purposeful. The reason is because the appointed times of month 1 are paralleled by the appointed times of month 7 that conclude with the appointed time known as the 8th day. And you can read about that in Leviticus 23:36. Remember that the Feast of Sukkot begins on day 15 of month 7, while the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on day 15 of month 1. Both of these feasts are 7-day feasts. The Feast of Sukkot ends on day 21 of month 7, while the Feast of Unleavened Bread ends on day 21 of month 1. After the final day of the Feast of Sukkot, which is day 21 of month 7, there is one final appointed time known as the 8th day, day 22 of month 7. It's the day when people can come out of their temporary dwellings, known as Sukkahs, and it points to a time when we are returned or restored to a permanent dwelling. It's a powerful message when we see it paralleled against the Exodus. In fact, the point of dwelling in Sukkot during Sukkot is to remember when the Israelites dwelled in tents after the Exodus. And we read this in Leviticus 23, 39 through 43. It says, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of Yahweh seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest, and you shall take on the first day of the, of the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh, your Elohim, seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month, and you shall dwell in Sukkahs for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in Sukkahs, uh, that your generations may know that I made the people of Yahuwah dwell in Sukkahs when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Well, if you examine the text of Leviticus closely, you'll see that it actually provided the commandment concerning Sukkot twice. We first read about it in Leviticus 23, 33, 36, and then again, in the text we just read at Leviticus 23, 39 through 43. Yahuwah was not stuttering. Uh, rather, he was pointing to an important rehearsal when the Israelites would literally go camping every year so that they would retain the necessary skills for a future exodus, a second and greater exodus from the nations that we've read about through the prophets. Well, currently we celebrate the appointed times which serve as a memorial and keep us anchored to the deliverance from Egypt, Egypt and the uh, journey to the Promised Land. Again, they aren't just about the past, they're rehearsals and they, they point us to the future as well. So it's important to understand that Israel crossed the waters of the Jordan 40 years after the Exodus on day 10 of month 1, which was Lamb Selection Day. They were led by Yahshua, or the patriarch known as Joshua, who bore the same name as the Messiah, Yahshua. Uh, we recently discussed how John, the immerser, was a priest, and he declared that Messiah Yeshua uh, was the Lamb of Elohim. Uh, that was all a pattern for the future return orchestrated by the Messiah. 
Now remember that Joseph was elevated to the firstborn status, and that was the significance of the famous coat of many colors that uh, given to him by Israel. It was a royal robe. We read about it in Genesis 37, uh, 3. It says, Now Israel loved Et, Joseph, more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. Well, remember also that the blood of the Lamb saved the firstborn in the house. And Yeshua, the Lamb of Elohim, specifically stated that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we know that they were led by Joseph, from the tribe of Joseph Ephraim. Uh, so we know that the house of Israel was represented by Joseph. So the firstborn Lamb of Elohim came for the firstborn sheep of Israel. His first recorded miracle was at a wedding at Cana uh, because he came to acquire a bride. And we, we've read in the past that the Hebrew word Cana means acquire. As we count the 50 omers on the way to Shavuot, we must be cognizant that not everyone who desires to attend the wedding will make it. Only those who are wise. Again, consider the ten virgins, consisting of five wise and five foolish. Did you know that 10 omers equals 1 ephah? Therefore, as we're counting 50 omers, we are ultimately counting 5 ephahs. So this journey involving a 50-day count in time also involves substance. It's not just time, but there's a substance involved here. There's a quantity. This span of weeks, Shavuot, involves the first fruits of the harvest which is the five ephahs that represent the five wise virgins who actually complete the journey and make it to the wedding on time. I hope you can better see the great significance of this time we're in. It's not simply some mundane count. It's the time when the bride must be preparing. It's the harvest. This is not a time to fall asleep because all of these patterns point us to a greater exodus when Yeshua will gather us out of Babylon and bring us back into the promised land. Our rehearsals are meant to prepare us for uh, that spoken uh, of by Jeremiah. He said, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahuwah, when it shall no longer be said, as Yahuwah lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as Yahuwah lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country, and out of all the countries where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their own land, and I will give to their fathers, uh, that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares Yahuwah, and they shall catch them. And afterward I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill, and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. But... First I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land with carcasses of their detestable idols and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. Well, we're rehearsing with an eye towards seeing a future fulfillment of this promise. Therefore, we rehearse with purpose, because, like I say, we're still talking about the exodus from Egypt. And he specifically says, uh, will no longer be said as Yahuwah lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so we just had Passover, and we're still talking about the exodus from Egypt. So we haven't seen this uh, great return, this great exodus that uh, the prophet Jeremiah was talking about. Well, well, it must have been an awesome thing to... to uh, pass through the parted waters and then see them swallow Pharaoh and his army. The Israelites eventually had to turn their backs on Egypt and continue to follow the pillar and the cloud. It was a new beginning that involved a journey into the wilderness. Now remember how this new journey paralleled the eighth day of month seven? Well, the number eight is the Chet in ancient Hebrew, which represents a fence. And there was a separation uh, and hence a new beginning involving a wall. And it's interesting to note how they had uh, just been walled in by water. Well, now we're going to see that they're walled in into the wilderness as we continue. It was a new beginning for the Israelites, and they would be met with challenges. 
that would test their faith and teach them lessons. And here's what happened next as they camped at Marah on Omer Day 8. So then Moses uh, made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him a tree. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There Yahweh made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh your healer. Well, at Marah, the people found bitter water. Marah literally means bitter, and it could range from simply a bitter taste to poisonous. And in this passage, passage, it specifically says that people could not drink the water. Well, it was the third day since they'd passed through the waters. The third day out of Egypt, and literally the third day of the week. It was the third day of their new life, and they lacked the most important thing next to air. Well, it's generally understood that the average person could only su survive about three days without water. So these newly saved, born-again Israelites were on the brink of death, or so it seemed. There was water right there in front of them. Uh, they just had to be able to drink it. Well, the solution to the bitterness was interesting. Yahweh showed... Moses a tree, etz. The word for tree here is etz. Uh, the word for showed is yara, and it's a root uh, of the word Torah, and literally means point or teach. So you know, it was a teaching uh, aspect to this, showing him pointing to the tree. And this is one of the important lessons of Mara, and this is a teaching moment for the Israelites. The Hebrew word etz typically means tree, as in the tree of life. Uh, so did Moses uproot an entire tree and throw it in the water? Well, actually the word etz can refer to any wooden object like a branch or a stick. The important thing is that the tree, the etz, made the bitter water sweet. The Hebrew word found in the text is matak, which means sweet or pleasant. So he made what was bitter sweet and pleasant. And remember that they just ate bitter waters, mar or bitter herbs, I'm sorry, maror at the Passover while they were covered by the blood of the lamb. Uh, there was bitterness associated with the Passover event. But now uh, that they were saved, they did not have to drink the cup of bitter waters. The tree uh, made the water not only fit to consume, but it was also delicious. Well, now let's consider the context of Mara a little further. As already mentioned, Israel was a bride on her way to a wedding. Yahweh had just protected and redeemed her by the blood of the Lamb and delivered her from the bitterness of bondage in Egypt. Yahweh brought her into the wilderness of Shur. And the Hebrew word Shur means journey and it also means wall. Uh, Israel literally hit a wall in their journey into the wilderness. She, she wouldn't be going any further unless there was uh, water to drink. And of course, you can't make bread without water either. And just when it seemed uh, that everything was going so well, it turned really bad. At least that's what it seemed like to the Israelites. And, and that's because they didn't know the plan. They didn't fully trust Yahuwah. And this was the first test after they passed through the waters on this journey of new beginnings. Israel, Israel was now completely delivered and set free from Pharaoh. So we must assume it was a very important test. So why did Yahuwah point to a tree? Well, that's the subject of great speculation. Those who follow Yeshua understand that he was hung on a tree. So the solution is really prophetic. In Acts 5.30 we read, The Elohim of our fathers raised up Yeshua, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Uh, in Acts 10.39 And we are witnesses of all things which he did, but in the land of the Yahudim 
and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. So a lot of times we see, you know, Christians wearing crosses and looking at crosses, but, uh, you know, we're supposed to be looking at a tree, looking to the tree and looking to the one that was hung on the tree. Well, the fact that Yeshua was hung on a tree was a sign that was supposed to bring us back to this very important teaching. He was also referred to as the branch, the Semach in Isaiah and Je uh, Zechariah. Well, we then understand that this lesson was all about Yeshua and his bride. It was for us. The solution was private, provided on a tree through the branch. Later, Israel would learn the reason for the test of the bitter waters. It was actually the test of an adulterous wife when a man experiences a spirit of jealousy and becomes jealous of his et wife who has defiled herself. And we read about this in Numbers 5, 11 through 31. The Torah provides an incredible ritual for a jealous husband and his suspected adulterous wife. The woman who's suspected of committing adultery must drink the bitter, Mara, the bitter water that brings a curse. Interestingly, the word for jealous is Kena in Hebrew. <clears throat> the root can also mean acquire, as we saw from the miracle of the water being turned into wine. Again, remember where the first recorded miracle of Yeshua occurred. It was a wedding in Cana. Coincidence? Of course not. Yeshua was at a wedding feast, revealing that he was there to acquire a bride through his, his blood. He turned water into wine. And remember, at that point in the wedding, the wine would typically have been inferior. That's when they would pull out the, the cheap stuff, the bitter stuff, the vinegar. The text in John 2 records that the Messiah, of uh, the master of the feast, tasted the water that was made wine, and it was delicious. It was the best. Of course, the water for the miracle was placed into stone vessels that were empty. That's because they were used for the water's purification that the bride had bathed in to prepare herself for her husband. Yeshua surely set the tone uh, through that first recorded miracle. He further elaborated on this theme at one of my favorite places to visit in the land, uh, Jacob's Well at Shechem. It was recorded in John 4 that Yeshua appeared there to an adulterous Samaritan woman in the field bought by Jacob. That field was inherited by none other than Joseph because he was given the rights of the firstborn. Remember that Joseph's bones had passed through the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan and then finally laid to rest at Shechem. And we read about that in Joshua 24:32. So Yeshua was on land that belonged to the descendants of Joseph, asking an adulterous Samaritan woman to draw water from a well that belonged to the descendants of Joseph, right near the tomb containing Joseph's bones. It's critical to understand the context of just about everything that Yeshua did, because oftentimes that's where the important message is found. And here we see an incredible emphasis on Joseph and an adulterous woman. <laughs> so during that event at the well, Yeshua told the Samaritan woman, If you knew the gift of Elohim and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The prophetic message being projected by that event is powerful, yet uh, either missed or ignored by no, most people. Again, context is everything. Yeshua later identified himself with water in Jerusalem on Hoshana Rabbah. He stated, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, Hoshana Rabbah is the last day of Sukkot, which is day 21 of month 7. And remember, that event paralleled the crossing of the Red Sea on day 21 of month 1. Well, ultimately, the waters of Marah uh, were focused on healing. So this test was all about the Messiah healing and restoring an adulterous bride, making her pure and undefiled so she can attend the wedding. 
We know the bride Israel still had Egypt in her heart when she passed through the waters of the Red Sea. She showed herself to be an adulterous bride later at Sinai in the midst of the wedding ceremony. She worshipped the gods of Egypt while Moses was on the mountain receiving the tablets of the covenant. They were the ketubah, the marriage contract. Since Israel broke the covenant, Moses broke the tablets. Israel was actually made to drink the bitter waters containing the, the ground-up idol of gold. And you read about that in Exodus 32, 19 through 21. The bride failed to learn the lesson of Marah. She did not diligently heed the voice of Yahweh spoken from the mountain. Thankfully, Yahweh sent his son to fulfill the covenant by accepting the punishment that the bride deserves. Now all those who joined with Israel uh, through the renewed covenant, do not need to drink the bitter waters and suffer the consequences of an adulterous wife. Instead, we're directed to the tree where Yeshua was crucified and took the penalty upon himself. It's critical to understand that he specifically drank the bitter waters, the vinegar, and accepted the associated curse prior to his death. This is an often overlooked event in the scriptures which with earth-shattering ramifications, and we read about it in John 19, 28 through 30, it says, After this, Yeshua, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine uh, was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it on to his mouth. So when Yeshua had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowed his head, he gave up his spirit. He knew that he had to perform that final act before dying. He had to do it in order for scripture to be fulfilled. He needed to do it for his bride from the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Recall that the blood that had been placed on doorways the prior evening at Passover was applied using hyssop. Now hyssop was being used to give Yeshua the bitter drink of sour wine sometimes translated as vinegar. The hyssop was connecting these two events, the shed blood and the curse of the bitter waters. Because of this final act of Yeshua, the bride is no longer subject to the curse. She can receive healing and cleansing. And that's why we, what we read in Revelation. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So the lesson for us is that we deserve the bitter waters and the penalty of an adulterous bride. Thankfully, Yeshua took the curse upon himself. And now we can look to the Messiah to quench our thirst. We, he made the bitter water sweet and we can drink freely the water of life. Now consider what happened after the lesson at Marah. Yahuwah made a statute and an ordinance for them. Mind you, this is before he gave the Torah at Sinai. Here's what he provided. If you diligently heed the voice of Yahuwah, your Elohim, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am Yahuwah who heals you. So Yahuwah was laying it out right uh, from the start of their new beginning. Diligently, diligent obedience is what he expects from his bride. If we fail to heed his voice, we will end up drinking the bitter waters. After setting down the mandate of diligent obedience, he then brought them to a special place called Elim. Uh, then they came to Elim, uh, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Elim is the blessing of diligent obedience. It is the rest and provision that Yahweh has prepared for his people along the journey. How sad that so many people equate diligent obedience with bondage and slavery. They, they fail to distinguish between Yahuwah and Pharaoh. Obedience to a loving husband like Yahuwah is meant to be a blessing. Obedience to a slave master like Pharaoh is what results in bondage. And that's why the word Mitzrayim, Egypt, uh, means bondage in Hebrew. When we simply trust Yahuwah, 
Uh, we don't have to fear and we don't complain or grumble either. He has no desire to enslave us. He, he doesn't have any desire to torture us or kill us. He has a plan for his people that's meant for good. But uh, the people, his people can't always see it. And that's why we have to trust him. What the Israelites failed to recognize was that they were undergoing a three-day fast. <laughs> and those bitter waters likely were filled with magnesium and calcium that would have certain cleansing and healing properties to rid them of all the parasites of Egypt. Uh, that's just an afterthought. And, uh, but uh, and a side note, we don't read that in the scriptures, but that's probably likely what was happening. So they never had to fear, just trust. Yahweh had a treatment plan for them, and Elim was just beyond those bitter waters. Elim literally means big trees. There were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, tamarim. Uh, these were date palms, and their fruit is incredibly sweet. In fact, they're one of the seven species of the land and the honey of the promised land. When you read about a land... Uh, flowing with milk and honey. It's not talking about honey from bees. It's talking about the honey, the syrup from these uh, date, uh, dates. The spring waters were surely cool and delicious as well. So Elim was a wonderful and refreshing oasis for the Israelites. It was always in the plan of Yahuwah to bring them there, but they needed to learn uh, the lesson at Mara first. If you've read my messages and books, you should be aware of the fact that 12 and 70 are highly significant numbers in the plan, the covenant plan of Elohim. These numbers provide the framework for the restoration of the nations represented by 70 uh, that will flow through Israel represented by 12. Yeshua made that perfectly clear when he first sent out 12 followed by the 70. We read about that in Luke 9 through 10. Now recall that in at Elim, the Israelites were still carrying the bones of Joseph with them. Uh, they would have been a constant reminder that this journey had much to do with the covenant fulfillment through Joseph. This stop was a reminder that the journey was about the nations. Of course, all of this uh, should have made them remember the promise to Joseph as they experienced an oasis on the way out of the wilderness of Shur, the wall. Joseph, in Genesis 49:22 says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. Sure. Look at the various pieces of wood uh, in this passage. The Hebrew word for bough is ben, which literally is sun in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew word for branches is bat, which literally means daughter or daughters. Uh, we're literally looking at a family tree through Joseph that's nourished by spring waters. And so here we, we see an amazing connection with Elim. At Elim, we learn that the only way to the spring waters is past the wall, the test of the bitter waters. These are the incredible prophetic implications concerning uh, Messiah ben Joseph. So what a beautiful picture that Yahuwah provided three days after their entrance into the wilderness. Of course, Israel would later learn the deeper significance of three days. It would be a sign of the Messiah uh, that we spoke about last week. Yeshua specifically stated, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's no coincidence that Jonah was in the water for three days and three nights. Israel would be cut off from the living in the midst of a week, which was the Wednesday, after being hung on a tree. He was in the tomb for three days and three nights, and then resurrected on the first of the Sabbaths in the Omer count. This message is being sent out on day 11 in the Omer count on the second of the weekly Sabbath in the count. And I hope that you can see that this exercise has deep significance for those who follow Yeshua. What at first seems like a banal exercise in counting, turns out to be filled with lessons for our future. We're on a journey to a place where the wedding occurs, but Yahuwah is looking for a faithful bride. Last week we talked about the harvest of the Messiah during the Omer count, and now we had his winnowing fork, as described by John. Well, the entire Omer count 
encompasses the grain harvest of the barley and the wheat. It involves cutting, gathering, transporting, threshing, winnowing, collecting and storing grain, and burning the chaff. It's a very intensive time of hard work that's a direct result of man's sin in the garden. Well, Yahuwah provided fruit trees, ets, in the garden. Man must now toil for bread because of his disobedience. We read that in Genesis 3, 17-19. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, ets, of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat uh, the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you shall return. The lesson of Mara was the same lesson that man needed to learn in the garden. Yahuwah pointed us to a specific tree in Etz that provides sustenance and healing if we diligently obey his voice. Uh, the curse to the man was specifically that he heeded the voice of his wife, and of course you can't uh, help but uh, uh, make that connection with the bitter waters and the test of the, the unfaithful wife uh, also involving this tree. So this period of time during the counting of the Omer should still be an intensive time for those who are the wheat of the Messiah and the first fruits of his harvest. It's a time uh, of the grain harvest when people would be focused on their daily bread for the upcoming year. In a future message, I hope to look at how bread also became a test in the wilderness. But until then, may we all examine our condition as a bride headed to a wedding. Uh, are we a wise, faithful, and pure bride prepared to meet her husband? Or are we still carrying the gods of Egypt and Babylon in our hearts? Do we need a fast and a cleansing before we get to the mountain? Consider the bitterness that we deserve. In fact, the world is literally going to get a taste of bitter waters called wormwood when Yahuwah plagues the nations. We read in Revelation 8, 10-11, Then the third messenger sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died. Many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Those who drink of those bitter waters will die, and the Proverbs liken an immoral or strange woman to Wormwood in Proverbs 5. <clears throat> on, the other way, on the other hand, those who are wise and diligently obey Yahuwah will, by keeping his times correctly and following his messenger, have the hope of drinking the living waters that provided healing and life. We read in Revelation 22, Then the messenger showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree, the ets of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The trees of the the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything cursed, but the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb will be in it, and the servants will worship him. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for Yahuwah Elohim will be their light. They will reign forever and ever. This is the fulfillment of the pattern and the ordinance provided through Moses at Marah. When the wise finish their journey, they won't need their lamps to guide them through this world of darkness. Their journey will finally be over. They can leave their temporary dwellings, their sukkahs, and move into a permanent home where Yahuwah provides them with light as well as a tree for the healing of the nations through the et salvation of Yosef. Barakot, my name is Todd Bennett from ShamaIsrael.net. Shalom.